Good. Uh, let me begin. Let me begin with a concept that is sort of overtaking physics. It's overtaken physics for a long time. It's called duality, or a duality of some kind or another. It's a sort of preliminary thing for my talk today to know that there are such things as dualities and what they are. Duality is a very simple concept. They're simply two equivalent descriptions of the same thing. And typically, one of those descriptions involves wildly fluctuating variables. It could be quantum fluctuations. It could be thermal fluctuations. And the other description involves very unfluctuating, simple, almost classical descriptions. I'll give you the simplest example. The simplest example is the uncertainty principle. We may have some kind of configuration, a wave function, function which is spread all over space, wildly fluctuating, has no simple uh, description in terms of a classical uh, wave packet on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a complementary description. It's called momentum space. And in momentum space, the wave packet is nice and concentrated. This is a duality between a wildly fluctuating thing and a non-fluctuating thing. Is a duality between low temperatures and high temperatures. There are systems for which there are two descriptions of exactly the same physics. One of them in terms of a wildly fluctuating, extremely high temperature description, and an equivalent description which replaces it by something at very low temperatures with very little fluctuations. This is called Cromer's Wannier duality. They replace a wildly fluctuating, very strongly coupled, sometimes highly quantum mechanical system with another system which is much less so and much more classical. A number of years ago, I'm not sure exactly how long ago it was, we began to recognize that there was a special kind of duality. This kind of duality replaced, or that it was, it was a duality, between very strongly coupled, highly quantum mechanical systems of many, many degrees of freedom on the one hand. On the other hand, a system described by gravity. That sounds crazy, and it did seem crazy, but it appears to be true. And when I say gravity, I mean quantum gravity. This connection has really been at the heart of an explosion in theoretical physics. And it's an explosion in theoretical physics which is not just about quantum gravity. It seems to be infecting just about every area of theoretical physics. Right, a whole bunch of areas of physics. Quantum field theory, string theory, condensed matter physics of various kinds, high temperature superconductors, strange metals, all kinds of things. Fluid dynamics, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and chaos theory. Theory of error correcting quantum codes. That's a computer science issue, computer science subject, in quantum computer science, if it ever comes to pass. Complexity theory, another thing out of the area of, um, of uh, computer science. And black holes. All of these things have been deeply influenced by the same kind of duality. What's at the middle of it? Right at the center of it is on the one hand general relativity and on the other hand quantum information theory. Let me start with an observation of Feynman's from 1980. I think it was about 1980. He asked himself, why is it so hard to solve quantum mechanical problems? What he meant by that is, why is it so hard to simulate them on a classical computer? And his answer, this is a quote, a direct quote, because Hilbert space is so damn big. Let me give an example. There are many systems which can be described by bits. Bits are just bits of information, like inside your computer. A state of such a system is typically described by a string of zeros and ones. There are physical systems like this. In fact, every physical system can, uh, can probably be brought to a description like this. So a state of the system is just a string of zeros and ones. Supposing there are 1,000 bits. Well, if there are 1,000 bits, you can, get, you can write down the configuration, just n binary digits. You can write them on about a page. Okay? So not too bad. On the other hand, take the same systems, but think of them as quantum mechanical. Quantum mechanical qubits. Qubits are quantum mechanical bits. What you can do with qubits is you can superpose states, quantum mechanically superpose states. I assume you all know what that is. You can quantum mechanically superimpose the states, 
and you have to superimpose them with complex coefficients. How many quantum complex coefficients does it take? Well, there are two to the n configurations of these uh, bits. So it takes two to the n complex numbers to describe the quantum mechanical analog of the bit string. Two to the n complex numbers would be so large that if you had just 400 qubits, you could not fit the entire description of the state of that system into the entire known universe, even if you packed it at Planckian density with zeros and ones. Quantum states are typically exponentially complex in some sense. This, the term complexity has a technical meaning, but for our purposes, it just means hard to describe for now. Now, another issue. Why is quantum mechanics so hard to understand? This is not the issue of why it's hard to, to, um, to compute. It's a question of why it's hard to understand. The thing which is most peculiar about quantum mechanics is entanglement. I'm not going to describe entanglement to you any more than just to say it's a funny situation in which you can have a pair of systems which are not connected in any way, but in which you can know everything that can be known about the combination of both of them and know nothing about either of them. Now, if that blows you away, it should. And it's what made Einstein very uncomfortable with the concept. Einstein, Rosen, Podolsky, entanglement. And uh, it is what made Feynman say, Nobody really understands quantum mechanics, which, by which he meant nobody can really get their head around this concept of entanglement. Again, I'm not going to describe it. I'm just going to assume you know a little bit about it. Now, when you take the two together, the enormous complexity, which makes it so hard to describe quantum states, and you add entanglement, you discover that entanglement becomes a useful way to think about navigating your way through the huge Hilbert space. Patterns of entanglement, how things are entangled, can often be used to cut down the enormous size of the Hilbert space of states and focus on a narrow little piece of it. Here's an example. Supposing we have two n particles, and those two n particles are entangled in pairs. All we know is they're entangled in pairs. We don't know the details of how they're entangled, but we know they're entangled in pairs. Then. Given that they're entangled in pairs like this, the number of possible states is cut down drastically to the point where we really can handle the, uh, the description of the system. This picture is just a picture of pairs of particles. The blue lines just represent the mathematical fact that they're entangled. But this is also called a very primitive tensor network. I will explain roughly what a tensor network is as we move along. OK, now, entanglement is not only a property that has to do with particles. The vacuum, empty space has entanglement. Now that sounds crazy. Empty space is just empty space. What is there to be entangled? There's nothing to be entangled. In quantum field theory, the vacuum is full of vacuum fluctuations, virtual pairs, particles which come and go very quickly, quantum fluctuations of fields. And those quantum fluctuations are entangled, and they're entangled in a very special pattern is we can imagine space being divided down the middle. Imagine space being divided down the middle to space. And now break it up mathematically, not physically, break it up, um, tessellate it. So little round tessels near the place where you divided things up. And as you move away in a kind of scale invariant, fractal kind of way, self-similar way, you make bigger and bigger tessels. This is purely in your imagination. All right. What does the pattern of entanglement look like in the vacuum? Well, it looks approximately like this. Each little degree of freedom, each fluctuating quantum field, is correlated with or entangled with a neighbor just on the other side of the boundary that you formed. This one with this one, this one with this one. And if you count up all the number of pairs of entangled degrees of freedom, what you find is that it's proportional to the area of the boundary that separates the two regions. S. S stands for entropy, and it's called entanglement entropy. And it's just a measure of how much entanglement there is in the vacuum between the left side and the right side. And it's proportional to the boundary area. 
I just illustrate this as an example of where entanglement comes into physics today in quantum field theory. Here's another example. If the quantum field theory happens to be one-dimensional, well, quantum field theories can be one-dimensional, one-dimensional in space, then the entanglement has a slightly, has the same character to it of entangled pairs, but the total number of entangled pairs, instead of being proportional to some area that splits them, is proportional to the log of the total size of the system. You can work that out very easily just from the picture. Mostly, I just wanted to say that such concepts exist. Entanglement, and they tell you something about how the quantum state is constructed, how it's correlated, and how it fits together. All right, now condensed matter systems are much like quantum field theories in many respects. In particular, one particular kind of condensed matter system is called a spin lattice. A lattice of degrees of freedom laid out in space is a bunch of qubits or a bunch of spins forming a spin lattice or forming a condensed matter system. All right. Uh, I assume for the moment that they're interacting in pairs, neighboring pairs. If they're interacting in neighboring <coughs> pairs, that creates a pattern of entanglement between them. And it's a very specific kind of pattern entanglement, pattern of entanglement. And the question is, if we were condensed matter physicists and we wanted to write down the wave function of the system, the state vector for it, could we use the pattern of entanglement to get a handle on it? The answer is yes. Right. The breakthrough in these ideas were called tensor networks, and they were due to a uh, physicist named Vidal sometime around 2006. And I'm going to describe it to you just in pictures. The real degrees of freedom of this system are the red dots. They're the spin lattice. You invent an auxiliary collection of degrees of freedom, which are really almost a kind of Feynman diagram. The Feynman diagram begins at the bottom with an imaginary particle which splits into two, and those two particles are entangled. Then the two particles scatter. When they scatter, this one becomes entangled with this, and the entanglement propagates through this fake Feynman diagram. As you go up, entanglements on smaller and smaller scales develop. And eventually, by the time you get to the top, where the real honest degrees of freedom of the system live, not some mathematical auxiliaries that you've introduced to describe it, but the real degrees of freedom, the entanglement structure has been built in by this crazy Feynman diagram, which is not really a Feynman diagram. I just draw it, but it has some similarities with a Feynman diagram. And it represents the entanglement structure of the quantum state of a large number of, they could be atoms, they don't, not really spins, they could be atoms uh, in a line. This was a breakthrough. This was a breakthrough because it allowed us to navigate through the enormous complexity of Hilbert space for certain systems. Here's another example. In this example, the real degrees of freedom, the red dots again, are arranged on a circle, a periodic lattice. This is something that condensed matter physicists are always interested in. A periodic lattice. How do you fill it in with a tensor network in order to describe the state of the boundary? Here's the kind of tensor network you would draw. Again, it's a tool for calculating the boundary, for calculating the wave function of the little qubits that live on the boundary. The tensor network is purely an auxiliary bulk geometry. By a geometry, I mean, well, it sort of has a look of a geometry if you, uh, if you uh, you know, wiggle your eyes a little bit, you might see some sort of geometry there. But it's not real. The real thing is on the boundary. Is the tensor network that you draw to describe a state unique? Not even approximately. There are many, many tensor networks that can describe the same quantum state. But for any quantum state of the boundary theory, there is a minimal tensor network. The minimal tensor network means the smallest thing of this type that you can use to construct the boundary state. The complexity of the state, the important word, the complexity of the state is simply a measure of the smallest tensor network that can describe that state. It describes how complicated it is to navigate your way through the Hilbert space to find that state, the smallest tensor network. And that's an important concept. It also defines a kind of coarse-grained geometry, a lattice geometry almost. 
Okay, here's a question that tensor networks can answer. Uh, I've picked out a particular tensor network, uh, sorry, a particular question. You might be interested in dividing the system into two pieces. The system now consists of the boundary, remember. You might be interested in describing and dividing into A and B and ask how much entanglement is there between the A side and the B side. It's a technical question. It's not terribly important if you have a precise idea of what it means, but it means some measure of the correlation between the bottom half and the top half. What Swingle and others discovered was there was a simple answer to this from the tensor network. Namely, you draw the minimal path through the tensor network that divides the system, and minimal means the smallest number of bonds that it intersects. That smallest number of bonds that it intersects is a direct measure of the amount of entanglement between A and B. That was very interesting, but well, was it a big deal? Well, if you're interested in entanglement in condensed matter systems, yes. If you're interested in anything else, probably no. Um, is there a way to break, given that two parts of a system are entangled, can you break the entanglement? Can you do something to destroy the entanglement? The answer is yes, you can. You have to feed energy into the system, but you can destroy the entanglement. You can disentangle A and B. And the question is, what would the tensor network look like for the state in which A and B had their entanglements destroyed? And that's what it looks like. It disconnects the tensor network into two pieces so that they're no longer connected. And the message here is that connectivity of the tensor network is connected to entanglement of the boundary degrees of freedom, the real degrees of freedom. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because it is deeply connected to something that has really revolutionized our understanding of many things. It is called ADS-CFT, it is a duality. It's a duality between gravitation on one side in anti de Sitter space and conformal field theories, whatever that is, a kind of quantum field theory. It was discovered in 1998 by Juan Maldacena and it is, uh, just, to, uh, just to locate you in uh, how important this is, it is by far the most cited paper in all of theoretical physics uh, for all times. Well over, I don't know, 15,000 uh, citations. It is very important, and I'm going to try to tell you a little bit how it fits together with this tensor network story. This is a picture of anti de Sitter space. Of course it's not, it's, it's a picture, an Escher drawing, but it is a picture of the geometry of anti de Sitter space. Now anti de Sitter space is a space-time. It's not just a space, it's a space-time with a t-direction and a space-direction. This is a picture of the space slice through anti de Sitter space at an instant of time. What does it mean? Well, what it means is this is a picture of a geometry you should imagine that every angel or every devil has exactly the same size as every other devil, but because of the curvature of space and the warping of space, when you plot it like this, it makes the devils near the boundary look very small and the angels and the, and the devils near the center look large. The phenomenon is the same mathematical phenomenon that makes Greenland look bigger than Africa. Greenland is not bigger than Africa. But because of the curvature of the Earth, when you plot it on a plane, Greenland comes out looking much bigger. The same phenomenon, mathematical phenomenon, distorts all curved spaces when you try to lay them out on the plane. And this is what the space of anti de Sitter space would look like. Well, anti de Sitter space is a space time. It has a time axis, it has a space axis. Up in here that we put in all the angels and devils, I couldn't draw them in. I'm not Escher, I can't draw them in, so I left them blank. And the bulk of the space, the space time, looks like a can of soup. I've repeatedly, of course it doesn't have a bottom and a top, it just goes on forever, but it looks like this. This is anti de Sitter space. What Maldacena discovered is that there were two descriptions of the same thing, a duality. And the duality had to do with quantum field theory, where the quantum fields live on the boundary of the space-time, on the, on the label, on the label of the can of soup, and something else. The something else 
being gravity, but we'll come to that. Okay, what's this drawing here? This is not the Campbell soup can label badly drawn. This is a Feynman diagram for the field theory on the, on the label. And it's supposed to be representing a Feynman diagram starting a particle enters the, uh, the, over here, a particle enters over here, and goes out over here and over here, a scattering process. Why is it so complicated? It's complicated because the quantum field theory is very strongly coupled. It's one of these quantum field theories which is so hard because the Feynman diagrams are so complicated that nobody can calculate it. What Maldasena discovered is that it is completely equivalent to a very simple Feynman diagram, except that the lines of the Feynman diagram go through the soup, through the bulk, through the interior of the can, number one. But they're very simple, easy to calculate. And those lines represent particles. What kind of particles? Gravitons. Gravitons or gravitation in the bulk is somehow equivalent to quantum field theory and the boundary. This is what Maldesen discovered how long ago? 1998. And it has, it has revolutionized theoretical physics tremendously. OK. This, again, is a picture of the space of anti de Sitter space. And let me ask a question. It is not the kind of question you would be likely to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Remember, there is a boundary quantum field theory that lives on the boundary. And supposing, once again, we were interested in the entanglement entropy between two halves of the field theory, the field theory on the top and the field theory on the bottom. The vacuum, how much entanglement is there? Well, a number of years ago, in another very brilliant discovery, two physicists named Ryu and Takianagi discovered that the answer to this, mathematically, is to draw the shortest geodesic that cuts A and B into two parts, and then just the length of that geodesic. Does that sound familiar? It should, because I just said something quite a bit like it a few minutes ago. But that's what they discovered. Next, another physicist by the name of Ran Ramsdank asked the question, what would happen if you did something that destroyed the entanglement between A and B? What it does is it breaks anti de Sitter space into two pieces. All right. This should be familiar. I just said something like it about tensor networks and condensed matter physics systems. There again. There's the tensor network describing a system that lives on the boundary, but which is being described by this kind of Feynman diagram tensor network. As discovered by Swingle and others, if you're interested in the entanglement between the top half and the bottom half, just find the shortest path through the lattice and count up the number of links, very much like calculating a geodesic length. And if you want to destroy the entanglement, it breaks the tensor network into two parts. What's the message here? I've just given you some very simple examples of something. But the message is that somehow anti de Sitter space, thought of as a real space time, a cosmological space time, the bulk of it is somehow the tensor network for representing the state of a boundary quantum field theory. This was big news. I mean, this is not a small thing. The bulk is being described by quantum gravity, the boundary by a strongly coupled quantum field theory. But the bulk space-time, the soup in the can, is also a real space-time in its own right. anti de Sitter cosmology, the space-time is the soup in the can, not the boundary label. The only difference between the boundary label and the soup of the can is the boundary label theory does not have gravity. It's just a common garden variety quantum field theory. The soup in the can, the space time in the interior, has real gravity and quantum gravity in it. So this obviously caught the notice of physicists very strongly. OK, let me go on and say studying the ground state of anti de Sitter space and the ground state of condensed matter physics systems is very interesting, but it's not all there is. You can heat systems up. You can put energy into them. You can make them vibrate. You can make them do things. And when you do, you can ask what the quantum states look like when represented as tensor networks. 
In particular, supposing you put enough energy in to heat the, uh, the uh, degrees of freedom that are being described in the boundary of the condensed matter system. How do you describe the resultant state as a tensor network? The answer is, first of all, the excited states are much more complex than the ground state. They must require a bigger tensor network. That's practically a theorem. The more complex a state is, in the sense of Feynman, in the sense of this enormous amount of complexity that Feynman talked about, the excited states are more complex and therefore require a bigger tensor network. The answer, I will tell you the answer, you carve out a piece of your original tensor network and you plug into it a bigger tensor network that has more structure than the original that described the ground state. The more complex the state, the bigger this bag of, um, of uh, goodies is. Okay? And you just plug it in. I couldn't draw it in a plugged in way, but that's the way it works. But there's something very interesting. Because of the nature of quantum complexity and because potentially it can be so large, what happens to a quantum state, or an excited quantum state, is its complexity begins to increase with time. As time evolves, the complexity of states gets bigger and bigger. That's not too surprising. Uh, you take just some random starting point for a bunch of uh, degrees of freedom and let them go. And as time goes on, they get harder and harder to describe, particularly if the system is chaotic. That hardness of description manifests itself in terms of these tensor networks by saying, as time goes on, the necessary tensor network to describe the quantum state grows. And it grows in a certain kind of linear way. This is not something easy to see, but it's something we've learned to understand. Tensor networks grow with time. In other words, this, the, the tensor network describes the state in an instant of time. As time evolves, the tensor network of a complex system grows up to a point. Okay. Keep that in mind and let's come back to anti de Sitter space. Let's come back to this quantum gravity uh, soup can uh, label duality. But now let's do something to it. Let's add heat. Let's add energy. We throw in energy into the soup can and what happens? The energy gravitates to the center. The anti de Sitter space has a gravitational field which pulls things to the center. The energy gets pulled to the center, and if there's enough of it, it makes a black hole. So black holes come into it. We throw in energy into anti de Sitter space. We make black holes. We've learned a lot about these black holes. For example, we've learned that the quantum field theory thermodynamics of the theory on the label is essentially exactly the same as the black hole thermodynamics, the Hawking-Bekenstein thermodynamics of a black hole. This interplay back and forth between field theory and gravity has played a central role in our understanding of many things by now. Okay, but what's inside the black hole? Black holes have insides, not only outsides, but you can fall into a black hole. If you fall into a black hole, you would discover there is space behind the black hole. In some particular description, the space looks like this. Here's the exterior of the black hole, Here's the black hole as seen from the exterior. Here's its horizon. But behind the horizon is a big bag of, I call it the bag of complexity, but it's just a big bag of space. That bag of space, when you solve Einstein's equations, no complexity, just Einstein's equations, that bag-like structure grows. It gets longer and longer and longer. The tensor network of a complex thermal excited system looks like a bag of complexity which grows with time. So it seems that these ideas connecting tensor networks, anti de Sitter space, duality between quantum gravity on the one hand and condensed matter systems on, or, or quantum field theory on the other seems to involve not only simple things, but things as complicated as black holes. Well, here's the black hole again, and here's its interior. Imagine somebody falls into the interior. Why can't they get out? 
And the reason they can't get out is because the interior grows too fast. The growth of the interior sweeps along everything that's fallen in and prevents anything from getting out. That's one way to think about the, the fact that a black hole can't be escaped from. All right, so Now let's come to an entirely different problem. We'll come back to this, of course. It's the problem that Alice and Bob have. Alice and Bob are space cadets. They're in love. But the captain of the ship tells them that Alice, for one reason or another, must go out on a separate small ship, and Bob on another separate small ship, then they have to do some exploration. And they get separated, accidentally. And they get separated so bad that they wind up 10 billion light years from each other. <laughs> How can they ever get back together again? So they have the idea, what if we created a pair of black holes? OK, there are two versions of the experiment. <laughs> The two versions of the experiment, version one goes as follows. Alice and Bob are equipped, they, either they are, they're equipped with a bunch of particles. Now, each one. Now, the particles may be particles that they found out there in wherever it is they are. Particles that never had anything to do with each other in the past. Completely disconnected, hi Tom. Uh, very far from each other, and they've never had anything to do with each other. Technically, they're unentangled. They have not been entangled. They're completely independent. And what are they going to do with those particles? They're going to take those particles, jam them together by gravity, and create two black holes. This is not going to do anything very interesting. It will create two black holes, very separated from each other. The green here indicates 10 billion light years. Each one of those black holes will have an interior. It will look like this bag of complexity. The bag of complexity will grow but they will be completely independent of each other and nothing interesting, no interesting connection between them. So they lose. They can't win that way. Here's the other experiment. Before Alice and Bob got separated, they had a bunch of particles in their laboratory and they entangled them. They created pairs of entangled particles. They're called Bell pairs. Bell for John Bell. Pairs of particles which were entangled, like that first diagram I drew you in the very beginning. And for each pair of particles, Alice has one of them and Bob has the other. They take them and they go out and they go out their 10 billion light years. Each has one half of the entangled particles. So the two states of the particle systems are highly entangled. They have entanglement between them. Does that prevent them from separating them? No. It doesn't cost any energy to, say, to separate the entangled particles. The particles are now very distant, but they're entangled. The meaning of that is that when they create the black holes, the black holes will be entangled. The quantum states of the black holes will be highly entangled, whatever entanglement means. Can we get any idea of what the quantum state of entangled black holes looks like from tensor networks, and yes, we can. Here is a pair of tensor networks. I've left out the interior here because, well, just the way I happened to draw it. Uh, two tensor networks for two completely disconnected systems of boundary degrees of freedom, or two completely disconnected systems. They're not entangled. Here's one, here is the other. That's what it looks like. Let me compare that with what the tensor network would look like if these, and these could be very far from each other. It doesn't matter. They could be 10 billion light years from each other. But what would the tensor network look like if the two halves were entangled? Well, here's the best I can do to draw it. It would mean that the tensor network would have an edge for each endpoint here. It would be connected to an endpoint in here. There would be some kind of bridge in the mathematical tensor network that connected them together. That suggests an answer to the question of what two entangled black holes will look like. The answer by now is a familiar one to people who study this kind of thing. Here it is. Here are two black holes on very, very distant sheets of space. They're so far apart, I've drawn them as completely independent. And if the black holes are entangled, 
Then they form what is called an Einstein-Rosen bridge in behind the horizon. Going in from one, you exit. You cannot actually exit for reasons that will become clear in a minute. But if you could exit, you would go in one and come out the other. It's called a wormhole sometimes. If five years ago somebody said I would be interested in wormholes, I would say you're crazy. There was no such thing. But we now know with virtual certainty that if two black holes are created with a high degree of entanglement between them, they have what is called an Einstein-Rosen bridge between them. This kind of geometry was discovered in 1935 by Einstein, Rosen, and Pado uh, Einstein and Rosen. Excuse me. Here's another picture of the same thing, and here I've imagined this is the 10, year, the 10 billion light years separating Alice and Bob. Of course, I haven't drawn it as 10 billion light years, but very far away. And the distance through the wormhole can be very short. So Alice and Bob, who have created this highly entangled black hole, now say, ah, let's jump in and do our thing inside the black hole. We won't be able to get out again for some reason. But you know, five minutes of bliss is worth a lifetime of agony and so forth. Well, there is a bit of a problem. And the problem goes something like this. Here is our entangled pair of black holes. It starts in some quantum state, but that quantum state evolves into more and more complexity. It gets more and more complicated as time goes on. What does that look like? Well, I'll, I love doing this. This is so much fun. Watch, watch carefully now. Here's what happens. The complexity causes the Einstein-Rosen bridge to grow. This phenomena can also be seen in tensor networks, the same exact phenomenon. That's why it's so hard for Bob and uh, Alice to meet at the center. Before they can meet, the thing grows. It's also the reason that you can't escape and get out of a black hole. Now, can they do something? They have the greatest technology in the world. It's been extremely powerful, the world's most powerful quantum computers. Can they put their black holes into quantum computers and prevent this from happening? The answer is believed to be yes. It doesn't violate any quantum mechanical principle to keep them from, but it's very, very hard. Whether it's possible or not is, is not clear in principle, but Alice and Bob cannot easily prevent the system from growing in between, and so they get frustrated. They can't do it, but, um, but still. In principle, there is a connection between their entangled black holes that doesn't go through ordinary space, not the long way around, but a short way through. That's called an Einstein-Rosen bridge. And the equivalence of Einstein-Rosen bridges with entanglement, yes, I didn't tell you the acronym that goes with this. The acronym for this equivalence between entanglement and spatial connectivity is called ER for Einstein-Rosen bridge, and EPR, which stands for Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen. Same Einstein, same Rosen. Podolsky was a newcomer here. The curious thing is that the discovery of Einstein-Rosen bridges and the discovery of entanglement by Einstein was the same year, 1935. There we are, ER equals EPR, and that is a genuinely new and unexpected principle that is, is really something very striking. It seems to be a deep connection between quantum mechanics and general relativity, something much deeper than we had any idea about 10 years ago. Another thing which we've discovered, which I've explained, is how the increase of complexity of a quantum state causes geometry to expand. This is very interesting. The space behind the black hole didn't exist before the black hole was formed. And then once it forms, a space forms in the interior of the black hole and it grows. What that growth of space has to do with other forms of growth of space, such as in cosmology, we don't know. But it is some kind of emergence of space out of entanglement that, uh, that's beginning. It's only beginning to be explored. Okay. Um, does it help us solve any physics problems? Um, apart from quantum gravity physics problems, does it help us solve anything else? 
You know, it's often the case. Newton invented calculus to solve uh, gravity problems. Calculus was a very powerful tool, and it solved all kinds of problems. I think we're beginning to discover, because of these dualities between gravity on the one side and other kinds of systems on the other side, that these ideas are beginning to play, hopefully, as I said, I don't like to sell things, but I think this is happening, that these ideas, connection between gravity on the one hand, quantum field theory, condensed matter systems, tensor networks, are beginning to solve problems that were generally considered much too hard to solve. Okay, so what kind of problems? Well, there were problems of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Things called, uh, the left side here is non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Phenomena like scrambling, which is another word for chaos and thermalization on the one hand. On the other hand, believe it or not, computer science problems are also being not so much solved, but being related to the problems of gravity and the problems of black holes. These tensor networks that are apparently equivalent to anti de Sitter space are also error-correcting quantum codes. This is a big deal, because if you want to build a quantum computer, an error-correcting code is absolutely essential. They're mathematical error-correcting codes. They're not the uh, things that you build in the laboratory. Maybe you will build them in the laboratory. And then complexity theory. Complexity theory is an important mathematical subject that uh, grew out of computer science. The heroes of it uh, were Alan Turing and Alonzo Church in its quantum version, um, Charlie Bennett, and dot, 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 down to the present. And I'll tell you a little bit, a very little bit, about how complexity theory is connected with uh, black holes. OK, I'm first going to study, I'm first going to tell you about the problem of scrambling. The problem of scrambling is if you have a complicated system, let's say in thermal equilibrium, and you perturb it, how does the information of the perturbation, you flick it, how does the information of the perturbation spread itself out through the system? How long does it take for it to get lost in all the degrees of freedom? How, can, how, how long can you track it and so forth? Scrambling is the process of information being spread throughout a system so as eventually to become lost in the many, many degrees of freedom. It's also called chaos. It's also called uh, thermalization or rethermalization and so forth. What we imagine is that there's a system which has a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian could be a Hamiltonian for a system of qubits, a system of spins. And we'll assume only that the Hamiltonian is a sum of pairwise terms. Every particle interacts with every other particle. It may or may not interact with every other particle, but at most it interacts in the Hamiltonian, let's say, with one other particle. So pairwise interactions. An example, again, would be a spin lattice in which every particle interacts with its neighbor. Well, with its two neighbors on each, si on each side. If it was higher dimensional, each particle might interact with three or four or five. That, that's OK. It doesn't matter. For systems like this, it's pretty clear how long it takes information to spread through the system. If you perturb one of these and it's in thermal equilibrium, it'll kick the next one, it'll kick the next one, it'll kick the next one, and the signal will propagate through the system in what's called ballistically with some kind of velocity. The velocity is called the butterfly velocity for butterfly effect. Uh, and uh, it'll take a time, which is, uh, it'll take a time which is linear in the distance or linear in the size of the system. That's scrambling for a system like, uh, like this. There are other systems where these terms in the Hamiltonian connect every pair of particles. Every pair of degrees of freedom is connected. An example that might be something like this would be a large, very complex molecule where everything is jammed together enough so that everybody couples to everybody else. But again, with pairwise interactions, this is a large complex molecule. This is a spin chain. All right, the large complex molecule thermalizes or scrambles much faster than the spin lattice. And I'm going to give you a model for how it scrambles. Here's the way it works. Imagine in this room here that somebody has some black ink on their hand. Now, we're going to play the following game. Every 10 seconds, 
we blindfold everybody. Every 10 seconds, we mill around like mad, and everybody finds a partner and shakes hands with them. And then we do it again. Every 10 seconds, they mill around and um, shake hands again. How many people, after n time steps, will have been infected with the black ink that Pierre originally had on his hand? Well, the answer is clearly exponentially growing. Incidentally, this is the same mathematics of the way that, um, uh, that the contagions spread. After one step, Pierre and his partner will be affected, the partner that he shook hands with. After two steps, each one of them will infect two other people. The infection will grow exponentially, but this is assuming that anybody can interact with anybody else. If we just had a long chain of people, each one can only interact with his neighbor, it would spread much more slowly. So after n time, or after t time steps, the number of infected people is 2 to the t. Well, how long does it take to affect everybody in the room? If the number of people in the room is n, then we take the logarithm of both sides. The time that it takes to infect everybody, that's called t star, it's a standard terminology, is, forget this factor 1 over t here, just logarithm of n, log to the base 2 of n. Now, what is 1 over t doing there? Well, what is the rate at which people interact? Obviously, the temperature. If the temperature was zero, everybody would be too cold to move around, right? As the temperature goes up, people get more energized. As the temperature gets very high, they move around like mad. So the, there is a rate here. The rate is the temperature, the time that it takes for everybody to get infected is 1 over the temperature times the logarithm of the number of degrees of freedom. And the number of degrees of freedom for a system like this is proportional to its entropy. S is entropy. Now, if you don't follow all of this, it's not terribly important. The point is that it's logarithmic in the size of the system with a coefficient, which is the temperature. This is called sc fast scrambling. This is called fast scrambling, and it's what you expect for this kind of large molecule. This is called slow scrambling. There was a conjecture. The conjecture was originally due to some combination of Hayden and Preskill, and myself and, uh, and uh, Sakino. And the conjecture had two parts. It went as follows. No physical system can scramble faster than the contagion model, than the shaking hands model. No physical system can scramble faster than this. The fastest that it does, shortest time that it can take to completely scramble a system of s degrees of freedom is 1 over t times log s. That was a conjecture. Okay. Now, the second part of the conjecture is that black holes do scramble this fast. Black holes, when something falls onto them, smear out their information at that rate. Okay. These were conjectures. They're not new conjectures. They're, I don't know, five, six, seven years old. I don't remember. But very recently, in the pair of really remarkable papers, these conjectures have been proved. Conjecture two was, in fact, in a sense, the first to be proved. It was proved by Schenker, our own Steve Schenker and Douglas Stanford, that black holes are fast scramblers and that they scramble in such a time scale. Okay. And then, number one, that that is an absolute bound now, the coefficient here, I haven't written down the numerical coefficient. There is a numerical coefficient, and they found it. No physical system can scramble faster than that. That they proved from an assum you know, the assumptions that went into it, but the assumptions are very plausible. And so this fast scrambling conjecture has now been proved. I have just a couple of minutes uh, to tell you how it was proved. Uh, <coughs> part of it, how it was proved, how they proved that black holes are fast scramblers. So I'll jump now. For those who don't know general relativity, you just have to close your eyes and uh, bear with it. For those who do, they recognize these as Penrose diagrams, the pictures of black holes. I won't explain them. I'm not going to explain them at all. This is a black hole in anti de Sitter space. The yellow region here is behind the horizon. The white regions out here are in front of the horizon. And you know, some of you know this picture. 
This picture here is an, this is anti de Sitter space with a black hole, or actually a pair of entangled black holes connected through a wormhole in the center. And this is the region behind the horizon, the yellow region. Here is roughly, now I'm paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing what's, uh, what Schenker and uh, Stanford did, but it goes something like this. They said, perturb the system a tiny little bit. Oh, incidentally, the boundaries of the anti de Sitter space are these vertical lines here. This is the boundary in space-time. These are the boundaries. This is the bulk. These are the singularities for whatever it's worth. They said, imagine going back into the past, deep into the past, and perturbing the black hole. A little perturbation, a little butterfly perturbation. A butterfly waves its wings at the black hole and makes a <coughs> tiny perturbation over here. That tiny perturbation will evolve as time goes on into a th two ways to think about it. If you think about it from the point of view of the boundary quantum field theory, it's just chaos. Oh, I mean, by chaos, I mean chaos. The butterfly waves its wings. That affects some neighboring molecules. The neighboring molecules affect other neighboring molecules, affect other neighboring molecules. And whatever the state of the system would have done, it sort of exponentially departs and goes off to some other state. It's got to do with why a little butterfly can wave its wing and affect the, the, uh, the weather 2,000 years from now. All right, so that was the picture on the boundary. But there was a much easier picture to deal with, and that, in you, that used the bulk geometry. And in the bulk geometry, what they found is this little perturbation, blue shifts, blue shifts and becomes a powerful shock wave that goes through the interior geometry. The powerful shock wave was much easier to calculate than trying to track the chaotic behavior of the boundary theory. Here is, again, I'm paraphrasing. What they found, what some combination of a few of us found, is that the scrambling phenomenon, the, the phenomenon that the system has spread its information out over the whole thing, that time scale is exactly the same as the time scale for the shock wave to reach within a Planckian distance of the horizon. It comes in and it goes back out. And this is easy to calculate. Just a little bit of general relativity will allow you to calculate how long it takes for the shock wave to get within a Planckian distance of the horizon. And the answer was, here it is, right here, essentially exactly the same as the conjectured bound on scrambling time. What they provided was also a numerical coefficient, the 1 over 2 pi, which is very, very precise. This was done by Maldacena, Schenker, and Stanford, several different papers, and also something very similar by the, uh, by the, um, by Kitaev, by Alexei Kitaev. So this essentially proved that black holes are fast scramblers. They were also able to prove that nothing can scramble faster than that. Some of these ideas are testable. They're testable in the laboratory. Why? Because quantum mechanical systems, large quantum mechanical systems of atoms can be built. They can be caused to interact rather strongly. Remember what I said in the first place, that there are now believed to be dualities connecting strongly interacting large systems with gravity problems. And you can't test gravity. That's too hard to test. But you can use gravity to calculate and then test in the laboratory how fast various kinds of scrambling phenomena happen. Monica and Brian designed an experiment. Uh, Brian's experiment was based very much on the work of, um, of Maldacena, Schenker, and Stanford. And they think they can really do the experiment, effectively on what is a cold atom system representing sort of a large molecule with everybody interacting with everybody else, perturb it, and ask what happens to it. So some of these things can be checked. This is very interesting. I don't think, they'll, I don't think they expect to find any great surprises. It, of course, would be um, very surprising if they violated the bound and found that scrambling took place faster. 
probably that won't happen. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that. I will not try to get into complexity, which is my own interest in this subject, but uh, complexity theory is beginning to play a central role in the understanding of the growth of the interior of black holes.